Welcome to Dutch of Fries No Slaw. It is Sunday evening. We're coming to you a little bit later than we typically do. We are here for our Tribe Talk, our FSU panel with a bunch of distinguished guests, as well as myself and Richie, uh, on a Sunday night to talk a little bit of FSU football. Um, gentlemen, thank you all for hanging out. We're going to be joined by one more in just a moment. Um, Ingram's on vacation in the mountains of, of Virginia, Ingram Smith of the Nolcast, and he will be here shortly. Let's go around the horn real quick. Most of you guys have been on before. Ben and Carter have it. They're the new additions. But let's go around the horn. We'll start in the top left. Uh, we're talking about Hollywood Squares earlier. Let's give a quick uh, give a quick intro. Plug where you work. I don't know. Plug wherever you want. Brendan, ask for a sponsorship. Well, you know, whatever you want to do. Brendan can start us. And we'll, we'll go down to Kurt and then go through the rest of you guys and, and say hello. So do you want me to go, TJ? Is that what's happening? It's all you. Okay. Well, first off, guys, that was a great introduction. I love the music there. It's awesome. It's so good. <laughs> sure you uh, <laughs> So I'm Brendan Sedona. I'm with Knowles 24-7. I produce and uh, sometimes host the On the Bench podcast, which is in need of sponsorship. I'm not saying it's the most <laughs> – it's not the most popular FSU podcast out there, but I think it's the most F popular FSU podcast without sponsorship. So <laughs> if you're looking for a home, you know, we'll work for money. DM uh, but, me and I'll, I'll hook you up with Brendan for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, but no, thank you for having me. Second year in a row. Happy to be here. Seeing some of my buddies uh, with me in the Hollywood squares. So yeah, so be be fun, I assume. We'll see. Kurt Weiler, uh, newly with the Osceola on the Rivals Network. Recently moved there. This is my finished on my first week, actually. We're previously the Democrat, the Tallahassee Democrat for the last, what, almost five years, four and a half years. Very excited for the change. Excited to be back again, like Brandon. I think this is my second straight year on here for this. Excited. I mean, 20 days out. Oh, I didn't know I was up, TJ. You didn't give me the warning. Uh, no, I'm I'm Ben Myers, and I work for uh, Tomahawk Nation. I've been on the beat for this past year since the spring. Um, and unlike Josh Newberg, I'm a big chicken tender pub sub guy. So I just uh, love him. Good man. <laughs> Oh, I'm up. Okay. Hey, guys. I'm uh, Carter Carls. I work with the uh, Tallahassee Democrat. Um, I guess I'm the newest of anybody here. I, this is my first offseason, first season uh, covering Florida State. First time on uh, uh, on this show. Uh, I guess you guys do it once a year, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, happy to be here, and uh, thanks for having me, TJ. You bet. Hello, everyone. I'm David Hale. I work for ESPN. I, I used to live in Tallahassee and cover Florida State like a decade ago, and I've stopped paying attention to them ever since then, so I have nothing to <laughs> offer. Uh, this is my second time on the show. I'm not happy to be here. I'm here against my will. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, I don't have anything to plug, uh, but, you know. Ah, uh, new season, new ep episodes of Bluey come out uh, this week for anyone who has small kids. I'll plug that because I love Bluey. Your lighting definitely looks like you're in a cave in Al Qaeda. Just, just throwing it out there. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the whole Taliban. I believe they're Al Qaeda is in need of like new leadership. Is what I've gathered. I don't read a lot of the news, but I understand that they are in need. I'm sorry, TJ. I, I did not mean to go there. <laughs> well, well, you were there, and uh, no worries. Um, yeah, David, I want to ask you you've been doing uh these twitter spaces you're a fan of these twitter spaces where you're i mean <laughs> you like doing them? Oh. Do you also do those against your will uh so this is a good question um i don't know how much i'm allowed to say on this <laughs> topic at the moment uh let's just say like much of what i do uh for i do it and enjoy it and find some uh reward in it my employers are not always as big a fan of everything that I do. Uh, so we are, we may be coming to an end of the Twitter spaces uh, run, but it has been fun. Uh, I didn't really know what Twitter spaces was beyond the time everybody tried to fire Mike Norvell. Um, <laughs> but maybe, maybe before General we finish Sam. our last one, maybe before we finish our last one, I talked to him about having, having him coming on and he was like, I'll, I'll definitely do it. I'm just not quite – he's still got some emotional baggage from Twitter spaces from what my understanding is. So he but he actually said – he told me and Andrea that he almost joined. He was like this close to joining the Fire Mike Norvell Twitter spaces and just jumping in. And I was like, it would have been the most baller thing you've ever done, and it yeah. would have completely turned around people's opinion. 
Um, but anyway, that's not here nor there. Anyway, yeah, some pro Twitter spaces, but um, I can't guarantee that ours will be lasting very much longer. Um, I have one more follow up for David, and then we'll we'll get on the on the way with the show. Um, Richie mentioned it kind of looked like you were in a cave, dark, not great lighting, smaller, uh, more intimate setting. Your cave or the hallways between Miami's new locker rooms? <laughs> you know, the linemen I hear have to turn sideways to get down the the aisle. I um, I gotta say uh, that was the first thing that jumped out at me. Not a large like you. If you got two dudes getting dressed, um, don't no one can really go in. Yeah, I believe there's. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm gonna be careful what I say. <laughs> there, I think David's trying to say they'd be they'd be bumping butts. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Don't yeah. don't want two yeah. linemen dressing next to each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, I do, by the way, by the way, I have I, I am in a dark cave right now. I have one of these like photo light thingies. I guess I can use it, but I use this for when I'm doing like important stuff. Hang on, let's see. Is that, no, that doesn't not help at all? Well, uh, David, I give you the, 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 the unprofessional <laughs> setup. This is the unprofessional setup you're getting. I, yeah, I don't think lighting from the side is really helpful. And yeah, trying no, to I don't have a good side. That's problematic. <laughs> Uh, real quick, if David is, uh, if your spaces is going wayside, uh, if you're going to get sponsorship, if you want to send them my way for on the bench, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Brendan, what are your thoughts on the offensive line? You know, on the bench, the sponsorship <laughs> is just not where we think it should be. Um, okay, I got one for uh, one for Carter, and then we'll we'll go. Carter, I challenge you. Have you had have you had Guthrie's yet before you came on here? Have you made a stop or what's the situation? Um, I have. Would you be offended if I told you I ate Zaxby's a day? <laughs> not as, I mean, not really. I mean, I would be offended. You're like a competitor, so I just yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know Guthrie's, me. but look, I'm I, offended. I come from Texas, and and down there we love us some Canes. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of uh, kind of a Canes guy over Guthrie's. Wow. I have to say, you offended people on two levels by saying that you were a Canes guy <laughs> um, <laughs> off the bat on this, but. Um, no, I appreciate all of you guys for coming on. We we do have a good time with this. We do really enjoy it. We try to keep it pretty light, try to keep it pretty fun. Um, I do want to give some quick shout outs and, and we'll get um, underway. Do us a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening later or watching later, um, make sure that you hit that like, like and subscribe button. If you really enjoy it, um, hit the share button. Shout out Guthrie's in Tallahassee, 1818 West Tennessee Street. You can visit both their locations. Hopefully, if you're going up for the Duquesne game, you will be stopping in and getting a tender box, double fries, no slaw. Make sure that you tell them we sent you. Uh, another quick, quick shout out to Gramco. All of your Delta 8 needs, whatever you need there, from pre-rolls, vapes, gummies, um, hard candy, wake and bake coffee, whatever you need on that, you can use the code DFNS25 to save 25% there. And then a quick, quick shout out to Garnet and Gold. If you're watching this, you're a huge FSU fan. You should not shop anywhere else for your FSU gear. Go to GarnetandGold.com. Use code NOSLAW, N-O-S-L-A-W, and you'll save 15%. If you order $75 or more, you also get free shipping, um, which is also a, a huge, huge plus. Appreciate Garnet and Gold, Graham Co., and Guthrie's for their support. Whew, I'm out of breath. Richie, take us away. Yeah, just, um, again, the, just to echo, teach, echo CJ, thank you all for coming on today. Um, just want to talk about the newcomers, right? Like a, this roster is full of transfers, right? Whether it's Jordan Travis or beyond, but what new transfers have really stood out in fall camp? You know, we, we've heard a lot about Johnny Wilson, Duspan. I, I, I really want to get your guys' thoughts on the receiving group. Um, let's start with Brendan and, and go around the horn because – this is a completely transformed receiver room, right, Brendan? Yeah, they added four transfers in the offseason. Uh, now, obviously, Winston Wright has some limitations with uh, the injury that he suffered in a car accident over the spring. I think that's been pretty well documented. And, and that really, uh, you know, beyond the scope of, of the accident, and it seems like he's moving in a good direction with rehab. But it's just a football perspective, purely, like that was a toughie for Florida State because Winston Wright was uh, – kind of the, the crown jewel of your transfer class for wide receivers. He had about 1,200 receiving yards over two seasons at West Virginia, a pretty dynamic kickoff returner, which is something Florida State needed and, and had a chance to kind of develop into that true number one that Florida State really hasn't had for, for several seasons now. Um, but 
Uh, I will say an optimistic standpoint when looking at the transfer wide receivers, and I'm sure the guys could can give you more insight on, on a few of them, but I want to focus on Deuce Span simply because when he came here in the spring, he was a converted quarterback who played a little bit of wide receiver at Illinois. Uh, when he did catch the ball, he was extremely explosive, but just didn't get a ton of at-bats at Illinois. And you kind of saw why early on at Florida State. Like the spring, he was just extremely raw, not really natural in attacking the ball or trying to catch the ball, just like he was fighting it. The routes he was running, kind of clunky, awkward. I remember thinking to myself, like, yeah, he's a project, but like that's not even – like he has a year to – he may not be someone who could contribute for a year if he contributes at all because he just looked so unnatural. Uh, fast forward to – nine, 10 days into camp. And I'm not totally convinced that he's a guy who helps a ton this season, but he's shown enough to where I think you have to, to consider finding ways to get him the football, whether it's on kickoff return, whether it's you know, dialing up deep shots for him and kind of forcing the issue there, getting creative in other ways you get to span the football. He has transformed his body. He's added probably about 10, 15 pounds. Uh, they always say that in the off season, but he does legitimately look different. He is extremely fast, which was already well documented. But but what's standing out is he's catching the ball more cleanly, more consistently. Apparently, he was really good in the scrimmage yesterday. Uh, but it's been pretty good all preseason, and uh, and the route running just looks. It's not totally crisp yet, but there are things he's doing in terms of just breaking off the ball and um, looking more natural than he did you know, a few months ago. So to me, that's a really pleasant surprise for Florida State because I've kind of written him off as someone who could help out uh, this season. At this point, I think he's someone that you have to kind of account for in your game planning uh, at least a few times at this during the season. So, yeah, Span might change the complexion of the wide receiver room, which I would have never guessed a few months ago. Yeah, and, and I want to go to Ben here from Tomahawk Nation. It, one name we keep hearing from these practice reports is, is Johnny Wilson, right? It sounds like he, he makes phenomenal plays, but not quite as consistent as we want him to be right now. But, man, it, it, I'm, I don't want to go – as far as like a Kelvin Benjamin comparison, obviously it's easy because it's a tall receiver, et cetera, et cetera. But Johnny Wilson, uh, I, you know, I think when he came in here, a lot of people thought he was a glorified tight end. Sounds like we might really have something in him, Ben. Like, what have you seen from Johnny Wilson so far, the Arizona State transfer? Yeah, well, I think Johnny is definitely a, a receiver. I, I, I myself, too, kind of had those questions of, is this a guy who's going to be a tight end? Is he going to be an H-back what, what kind of different things are they going to do with him? And I think we've seen Johnny get a little more consistent here in the fall, but that consistency to me is still one of the bigger questions uh, surrounding him. He shows those flash plays. He's, uh, I mean, he's made really great contested catches in, in practice. We've seen him do it at times, but you also see the drops from Johnny. You, you see those inconsistencies, maybe not that crispness in the route running that you would like to see. But I, I also think he's come a, I don't want to say a, a really long way since he's gotten here, but I think we've seen growth from him. Maybe not quite like Deuce Span, who I feel like maybe not a completely different player, but he looks so improved. It's it's very impressive. Um, yeah, I think Johnny's going to be a contributor. I, I don't know what extent he plays or how much they target him, but I think with this FSU receiving group this year, we're going to see – each guy have their moment this year. We're going to see guys have quarters. We're going to see guys have halves. We're going to see guys have games. And I think Johnny's certainly going to be one of those guys. I just wonder where he falls in the pecking order. You know, uh, I think there's kind of, uh, I want to say an obvious one or two. I, I think there's a few guys that stand above the rest, guys like Micah or Malik, right, who, who we kind of expect to get more targets. But uh, a guy like Johnny, I think, you know, one player goes down here, one player goes down there. He could – be an X factor in a game for, for this team, especially with Winston Wright kind of, you know, that availability being up in the air right now. We just don't know what that's going to look like in the season. So, yeah, I think Johnny's super talented. And I'm really excited to see his growth because we saw, we saw him at the beginning of camp in the spring and he was so much more inconsistent then than he was now. So I think we've seen him grown a lot for sure. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see how they use him because I think he can be used in a few different ways too. Um, I want to ask one more on the wide receivers and then we'll kind of transition to some of the other newcomers. Uh, David, last year you ranked Florida state 14 out of 14 in the ACC. We asked you about that on here. And I, I don't know if fans were, I don't know. Florida State fans aren't reasonable ever, so they probably were at your at your neck for that. So, um, but it you know then the season started and like oh maybe David was right. Um, 
talk to us about what your perception of, of the wide receiver room is now. I, 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 you know, for those that watched last year or listened last year, I, I think every time we asked a question, we'd bounce it to somebody and then say like, okay, well, David, what's the national perspective of this? Like what's the outside? So David ended up talking more than anybody, but uh, your take on the wide receivers, the, the transfers, the additions, the guys coming back and, and where that room uh, kind of falls right now for Florida state. Well, first off, I think I should be talking more than anybody um, as being the best looking and most informed. Uh, no, look, this was a most thing last year. I, I, I took some heat for that. And then, like, as the season went along, the number of times I had people that would be, like, on Twitter saying, like, ah, crap, you were right. Like, it, it just was not a good group. And, look, you got, if you go back the last three seasons, one FSU receiver in the last three seasons has topped 400 yards in a year, and that was Tamari and Terry. That's insane. That's horrible production. Um, and what's worse, look, I, I, the, the room has been upgraded without question. And the trading Kenny Dillingham for uh, uh, Micah Pittman and Trey Benson, great trade overall. I, I highly endorse. Um, <laughs> bringing in talent has helped that room markedly. And having anybody in there that has some – cachet and some uh experience under their belt that can kind of lead the others i mean this is sort of when you look back at sort of the heyday of fsu's wide receivers the last great group that came through was that 2000 you know 12 13 14 group and they had a guy in rashad green who was as good a leader in that room as you will ever see and i'm not sure they've had another good leader since then i mean kelvin benjamin was not a guy that you want to have as sort of your 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 centerpiece um they had those great recruiting classes and none of those guys really developed tomorrow and terry was not a guy who you wanted to build your receiving room around even if he was the most talented guy um they just haven't had that i think the biggest question i have this time around and the thing that would hold me back from saying it's a really good group i think it is a deep group you mentioned some of these guys that well i don't know where their role at johnny wilson big guy um you know you do span that, that's kind of coming in with a little bit different skill set Having a wealth of skill sets is a huge change of pace for Florida State, too. They've tended to have sort of the same guy. Um, and now they've got pieces where you can create matchup problems for, for, the off, for the defenses. But what worries me is, is there a guy? And as you're, you're focusing on f filling roles via the transfer portal, it still begs the biggest question that has plagued three straight head coaches now, which is, why can't you receive or recruit and develop wide receivers at a place like Florida state? That's insane that that's not happening. So um, I wouldn't go so far as to say like the problem is fixed, but this is a markedly better situation than it was in a year ago. Um, I do, I do really wonder who is going to be the guy, because if you're Jordan Travis and you're a guy, a quarterback who is sort of trying to prove that you are as good a passer as you are a runner, you need sort of that receiver that you feel good about on every play. Like, no matter what happens, I can look for this guy and have, an, have a shot. I don't know that there's that guy on this roster, but there's at least five or six guys that can go out and make plays, which is probably at least four to five more than they had last year. Where'd you have them? Did, did you did you say, and I just missed it, where'd you have them ranked? Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. It was somewhere like middle of the pack, like six, five, five, six, seven, something like that, I think. But it was upper – Upper half, but not by much. But again, markedly better than last year. Sure. Um, good stuff. I appreciate it. All right. More newcomers. We'll keep this kind of thing moving around. Again, if you're watching, if you're listening, if you're on your mobile phone, if you swipe down in the chat, you can see the subscribe button, the like button. Hit both of those. And let's keep this thing going. Uh, Kurt Weiler, Osceola, the new rival site, the Osceola. You guys have known them for years and years and years. And now they've made a jump up now on the rivals network kurt another newcomer that's getting a lot of praise a lot of hype maybe even too high of expectations based on what the guy did the year before at that position but jared verse what are your what are your takeaways there what are your thoughts after seeing him uh, for a couple of weeks here in the fall camp uh jared, jared verse has been fascinating to watch i mean for one he probably talks the most trash out of any player I've ever covered. Like there are just certain days where walking into practice during practice and walking out of practice, he is very loud and in people's faces, letting them know that he's going to beat them today or whatever. And that in and of itself is very entertaining. I mean, when, when you look at him on the field, it, it, he's no doubt. I mean, he's a physical specimen and he has plays where he's absolutely dominant. My whole thing that I've tried that I, I've been doing this as recently as this week 
I, I've been trying to pump the brakes with some people of, I mean, obviously this is not your next Jermaine Johnson. I know I'm sure a lot of last year was talked about Jermaine and how good we thought he was going to be. And I think Jared's going to be very good, but I do not think that is at all a fair expectation for him. I think he's, he's had some really nice plays. I think he's also, I mean, I think it was a bit worrisome. He had a, a I mean, Julian Armella got the better of him, took him to the ground in a, in a rep last week. And some of that speaks to Julian, but He's uh, a the, the nice thing for him is that I think that groups a little deeper to where he will be a part of a group that's got to uh, contribute and not going to have to carry the bigger load on his shoulders like Jermaine did. But no, he's a he, he's looked good. He's definitely had some really strong moments. And, and I think they've really been pushing for just kind of that consistency with him on a play in and play out basis. I want to move to Carter. Carter, I know you said you're one of the newer guys, so I want to ask you about a new guy as well. There's been a lot of hype around a room that wasn't very good last year, and that being the linebacker room. Um, Tatum Bethune getting a lot of praise and a lot of admiration, the transfer from UCF. Obviously, we know what what we think we have in Kalen Deloach and hope to see him take a step up, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the linebacker room in general and uh, maybe specifically about – uh, what you've seen out of Tatum Bethune. Yeah, Tatum Bethune. I, I was a little bit surprised when I first saw him because he kind of just looks like a, a regular dude, right? Um, he's not super physically imposing, uh, but he, he makes up for that on the field. He's got great instincts, really packs a punch, um, and, and just a very smart football player and also a very vocal uh, player as well. He's kind of immediately – been uh, one of the better leaders uh, on the defense. And I think that also speaks to just the experience that he has uh, being being a multi-year starter for UCF. Um, obviously, he's a pretty proven guy. I mean, in the American Conference, he, he was a second team uh, player, uh, all-conference player for them. But, um, you know, coming to, to Florida State, he pretty much immediately translated that. Uh, the only the only kind of hiccup with him was he, he had surgery – I believe in May, uh, he told us it was uh, on a groin injury he kind of had from his time at UCF. But, you know, coming into the fall, he hasn't really been, uh, I guess, affected by that at all. He's, he's been the same player we saw in the spring. Uh, I know he had a great scrimmage last night, uh, according to what the, the coaches told us. Um, and then, obviously, I think this is a, a linebacking group that is, you know, Four, four people deep, and they, they feel pretty good about it. And they've got a freshman in Omar Graham, too, that uh, they're pretty excited about. But, you know, you've got Tatum, you've got Kalen Deloach, you've got DJ Lundy, you've got Amari Gaynor. Uh, the thing about uh, Lundy is, uh, I don't know the exact weight. I think he's lost almost 15, 20 pounds. Uh, just looks like a totally different guy physically. Uh, Kalen Deloach uh, as well, moving a lot quicker than he than he used to. Uh, and then Marty Gaynor's had a pretty good camp. So I think the thing about this linebacking group is not only do they feel good about their front line, their backups, but they can also be good situationally. They need to have three linebackers on the field. They need two, uh, you know, when they're a nickel and their base defense, they, they can do that. So um, I, I just think it's a group that's been pretty solid uh, in the spring and in the fall. And I feel like uh, it's just another reason to feel optimistic about this defense which I think, based off what we've seen so far, has the capability of being a top 25, top 30 defense this year. Yeah, I love that. And I actually uh, predicted uh, – we had did our bold, bold predictions last week, and I said I think this could be a top 20 defense. Um, I want to go to Ingram here and just see what he thinks about – Ingram, welcome to the show, first of all. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of newcomers, and just curious what newcomers – from your contacts, are you hearing that that are kind of standing out right now? Obviously, you know, we're talking about Jared Verse, Trey Benson, Micah Pittman, whoever it may be, but but what newcomers on the transfer portal, because that's where Florida State's living these days, unfortunately, um, are you really excited to see this year? Yeah, I don't even know if y'all can hear me. Yeah, you're good. We can hear okay. you. Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh. 
We'll now transition to Brendan. Just Sano. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> While we work on that, though, I will say it's a couple of people in the in the chat asking for the Garnet and Gold um, coupon code. You can use No Slaw N O S L A W to get fifteen percent off a Garnet and Gold. I do want to also pimp this a little bit. Am I allowed to say that? Um, we're doing a tailgate with Rising Spear for the Duquesne game. If you're coming to the Duquesne game, shoot me a message. Um, but essentially all you have to do is be a rising spear member. You can donate monthly. You can, you can send in a 20, $25 donation and you will have access to a tailgate with rising spear right out in front of Doak at the heritage fountain. Um, again, risingspear.com, all of our NIL efforts, um, at Florida state are very much appreciated and appreciate them and all the work that they're doing tailgate for the Duquesne game. Guthrie's chicken will be there. We'll keep it very on brand. Maybe we'll do some Garnet and Gold giveaways there. We'll see what uh, we'll see what those fine folks have going on. There'll probably be some Gramco there as well. But RisingSpear.com, appreciate the work that they do. Go sign up if you haven't already. If you need details on the tailgate, again, we'll have Guthrie's there. We'll have beer there. Um, we'll definitely have uh, shade, which is probably the most important thing in late August at any tailgate, uh, right beside the Heritage Fountain um outside of doke campbell stadium message me if you need anything at all you can also message the podcast the show uh, anywhere and i'll i'll be sure to answer you there all right talking about nil let's go back to david let's get the national perspective here sorry that we lost ingram trying to figure out some stuff but uh david what's the national perspective or maybe just even the regional uh, on fsu's nil efforts Yes, I mean, I, I think that FSU is probably in a better position than I sort of expected them to be at this point. Um, they, we know, like, looking back, what, a year and a half, the sort of financial hurdles that FSU was facing um, across the board. And I think you, you had to sort of look and say, here. so nationally, this is a, a thing that I hear a lot from um, ADs and administrators, is that the challenge of NIL with the collectives is that you have boosters now kind of coming to administrators and ADs and coaches and saying, well, where do I give my money? Do I give it to the school or do I give it to the collective? And I sort of thought that we would see FSU being in a place where the school was like, we need the money. We need the money. Like we're, we're in real bad times, but they're not. I mean, Michael Alford has done a great job of addressing the immediate financial needs, getting some real investment from the boosters, to, to build what they need to do facility wise and still have some real enthusiasm surrounding what NIL is. Uh, I, we could go into a long wormhole about NIL and, and what it is or isn't. Um, but the truth of the matter is you need boosters signing up to want to be involved with your, your collectives. If you want to be playing at this level of football, if you want to be playing championship level football, if you want to be on the same level as Clemson and the SEC schools. So I, I think it's an, better place than I was expect, expecting. Um, are they where Florida is? Probably in the neighborhood, at least. Are they where Texas A&M is? No, but nobody's got oil money like that. So I don't know that like that's necessarily the good uh, point to start from. I think they're in a place where uh, it, I, I'm not sure they're blowing anybody away, but I don't know that you want to be in that place because for as much as we – still don't know where the future of NIL is and how the NCAA is going to enforce stuff and what's okay and what's not uh, and what the potential of like, you know, every time you hand out a new NIL deal, NIL deal to a player, what that means for the next five players down the road. I think being in a good sort of, you're in the, the, the good end of the bell curve, but you're not all the way out in the tail. That's probably not the worst spot in the world to be there. You wouldn't be seeing the success they'd be having in the transfer portal uh, if they didn't have so, a solid infrastructure. Um, I think, it, you know, and again, Michael Alford, for whatever you want to say about him, I think one thing that is, is pretty proven is he understands how to get people excited to open up a, pay, uh, a checkbook for Florida State. So they're in a much better position leadership wise than they've been in a long time, too. And I want to go to Brendan here. You, you had a story recently on Knowles247.com. Y'all go subscribe that everything you could imagine on florida state over there Just don't sponsor their pod yeah, yeah do, do not don't. sponsor do not sponsor them <laughs> i'm Absolutely going with reverse not. psychology now we don't want your sponsorship <laughs> so don't even try it that's some sad stuff <laughs> but but i don't want to <laughs> oh yes well, this is the guy who has like 1500 sponsors for his podcast 
five but, but, and have turned down three in the last week. <laughs> Damn it! He's keeping him in the back pocket, uh, though. I, I, I did not know when was on, but I'm going to stick with Brendan for now. But you, you, read, you wrote a great story on NIL in, in Florida State and what we're doing currently. Just talk about Florida State's efforts in the NIL game because it's so new to all of us. None of us knows what's really going on. But what, what is Florida State doing with that, Brendan? Florida State's been super competitive uh, from where, obviously from where, so so take it back to December and early signing period and the debacle that was. And it wasn't just the Travis Hunter situation. There was three or four other things that happened in that span that I think was really illuminating for people in the Florida State fan base and, and people that have you know the ability to make a difference with NIL. To look at it and say, wow, like we really need to change where we're at with things. And there was already some initiative to move in that direction, but there wasn't a sense of urgency. And that has really changed with Rising Spear and kind of their revamped rollout in the spring. Uh, Matthew Quigley is the CEO there, and, and he's done a really good job in, in spearheading that and, and making Florida State competitive in that regard to uh, where you have the ability to retain current players. And uh, when you're able to do that, there's then enticing packages that incoming players know like, Hey, this could be, you know, awaiting for me. Uh, you have to be careful what you say. Uh, but there's things that could be awaiting for me, you know, based on what previous players have gotten. Uh, and that just wasn't a place where Florida state realistically was, was even looking to be at uh, consistently, you know, six, seven months ago. So I think that's the first thing we talk about NIL and what Florida state's doing. Uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the amount that it's grown and, and the amount of people who are uh, doing recurring, uh, subscriptions with Rising Spear and TJ, you might know the number off the top of your head, uh, but that's moved in a really positive direction for Florida State. Uh, the goal is to, for it to keep going. I think they're expe expecting a ton of, of growth during the season. Uh, but yeah, Florida State's been really, really ambitious in this regard, or not Florida State, but uh, people who are associated with the uh, collective that is associated with Florida State. Again, you have to be careful with, with how you phrase things with, with NIL. Uh, but no, it's it's been very positive, I think, for Florida State and what they've done to to get a lot of uh, recurring subscriptions, which is really kind of the name of the game when you don't have all the oil money and the, you know, like some other programs that have the the million dollar, billion dollar boosters uh, to, to that level. Yeah, they made a made a really good push at the end of um, end of April. Could, certainly couldn't have been uh, congruent with anything else that was going on at that time, but uh, made a really really good push uh, at the end of April. Got well up over a thousand. Um, just having contact with both Rising Spear and the boosters, the summer is really, really tough to increase donations. Like it, it's very hard for the boosters to do the same thing. It's just a time that people are traveling and not spending a lot of money. And then the fall rolls back around, August rolls back around and people start spending money again and, and, you know, donations to the boosters go way up and, and Rising Spear is about to make some, some pretty big pushes. And we'll talk about some of those, um, in a minute and we'll plug some of those things. Um, TJ, would you say Mims the word? Oh man, I'd I'd avoid that. Um, Mims is okay. definitely the word. Yeah, I don't want to have any. Want to go out on Twitter and you want to tweet about a kid? I was gonna say we don't need any beaking news on this podcast. Speaking of Ingram Smith, um, Ingram, a lot of people in the comments, a lot of people in the chats. First of all, they love your glasses. Second of all. They want to know if there's any way, and shout out to Nolcast that does contribute $1,000 a month to Rising Spear. Love that. Um, we should get Brandon to do that. Maybe he would get a sponsor for On the Bench if that happened. But a lot of people are asking in the comments, not only about your glasses, but about Trey Benton. Is it possible, we were talking about Trey yesterday on the phone, is it possible that Florida State gets a 1,000 yard back this year with the kind of stable that they've got, different guys getting involved? Uh, talk to us about Trey a little bit. Oh boy! <laughs> it happened again. Like right on command. <laughs> Is this thing working? Is no, it it's definitely not. Like I see. <laughs> the answer. Yeah, Ingram, we can't. Shades on Ingram. Here's what I have to do. He's going to. I'm gonna have to remove him and add him back. It's worked out splendidly so far. Carter, you're up. <laughs> Harlan just panicked, panicked and threw Carter to the main screen. No, no, somebody's got to go there when you take somebody out. Is this thing live? I think. It's, yeah. So it's David. David, no, you're up. <laughs> I need better space. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, I got this. Uh, uh, 
Just cuss out uh, Miami. He'll sound just like him. PJ, this I, is I, our I, best show I, by I, far. For yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I'm actually not even. I'm. I mean, it's a live this stream. Is the, this is the type of professionalism I come to. I've come to expect from this show. So, <laughs> thanks for having me be a part of it. <laughs> It's actually all running really, really well, minus Ingram, if we can just be honest for a moment. It's true. It's true. <laughs> um, all right. I want to save the Benson question because I know he's really, really high on him. So we'll come back to that. Um, again, give a quick – yeah, somebody asked about the Duquesne tailgate. Yeah, sh show proof of payment to Rising Spear for entry in the tailgate. If you want to shoot me a DM, I am pre-organizing a list for them so that we can get you on a list and you don't have to, like, fumble with your phone or anything else that day but yeah shoot me a, a dm on twitter tj underscore pittinger and i'm happy to kind of help out and facilitate anything there I'm trying to kill some time because i do want to hear in ingram's internet actually looked really really good until it like waits like three minutes and then he kind of went out so we'll see kind of how that goes we'll see if he comes back or not at this point people want to know about benson i'm gonna throw it to uh i'm gonna throw it to ben ben it's been a little while since you had we had you on here Ben Myers and Tom Ognation. Uh, let's oh. talk a little bit about Trey Benson. Well, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. Let's I was going to say, just give me the whole show, TJ. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to take over. I'm glad um, Ben's got the shades. I love it. Let's yeah. Go. Well, I saw shade. Ingram uh, get, jump out. So, you know, I just had to grab the shades to to represent. I don't have a beard right now. I feel uh feels weird. But uh, I love Trey Benson as a player. I think he is a really impressive athlete more than anything uh he's big he's he's fast he's he's everything that uh everyone has heard about him i don't know if fsu is gonna have a thousand yard back though i i just don't know with the state of this running back room if that is what they want honestly i i think game to game matchup to matchup um, and, and also, depending on health, they could switch up the way they use those backs. You know, last year we saw them use Jay Sean and, and Trey Sean in kind of a one two role. I feel like it's going to be similar to that, but leaning more towards Trey being the one and Trey Sean or being the, the two and supporting him. But they got a lot of really good backs in this room. Uh, Toto Feely is a, a really talented guy. Uh, Rodney Hill, CJ Campbell. I, I, I really like this running back room overall and i think they're all gonna get their opportunities but i definitely think trey benson's gonna be that lead guy i think my question though is by how much you know what's the difference between him and, and that next guy in the depth chart in in terms of the actual carries he gets by the end of the season so i love trey benson i i think he's a really really good football player and if they give him that opportunity to get 20 carries a game uh he could do a lot of special things. I just don't know how that's all going to play out. Who is this Walmart version of Ingram Smith that you brought into this <laughs> podcast? This is the best service you've looked all night. Listen, I don't even have a question for you. Just whatever you want to talk about while the service is good. Is some joker with glasses came on trying to talk about Trey Blinton? <laughs> no, no, I'm at, hey, I'm the upgrade. I, I'm, I'm not the Walmart <laughs> version. <laughs> Don't he's blame the target your internet now. He's the target version. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we lost him. Well, that was cool. yeah. And we lost Ingram just like yeah. that. I do like yeah. that Ingram's biggest contribution to the show yes. is making fun of how little sponsors on the bench has. Thank you. Yeah, we just lose him sometimes. I don't know what ends up happening with Ingram. Part. Yeah. We we get him making fun of Ben and then and then move him on. All right. Let's do this. Uh it's been a minute. Let's give a quick shout out to Gramco, Garnet and Gold, and Guthrie's. Appreciate their support. Um, if you check the comments, you can see the links and the codes to everything. Again, appreciate them. Make sure you like and subscribe if you're listening. Um, let's do this. David, I'm going to throw it back to you and kind of get your take here. Um, conference realignment. We'll, we'll ask quickly. Um, SEC Big Ten. And what day will it be announced that FSU is going to one of those? Great question. Quickly? Did you say quickly? <laughs> Go ahead, David. Uh, I'm sorry, TJ's mic goes. It's just not. I, I honestly, um, I don't think that this is happening soon. I think we are likely looking at probably a two to three year window right now. Um, the ACC is sort of in this weird holding pattern. Like, you know, the scene in Austin Powers where, the uh they're driving towards the security officer and he's like no no and they're like get out of the way get out of the way and he's just standing there and they're really far away 
but eventually they run over him. That's where the ACC is right now. They're, they're not able to move out of the way, even though they've got some runway to move. They're not doing it. Um, I Somebody's going to challenge the ground of rights, but I think it's probably two to three years off. My guess is there's a good chance that it's Florida State that does it. Um, the question about ACC, or SEC Big Ten is an interesting one because I think clearly SEC is probably the better fit for Florida State. Um but they probably have much more value to the Big Ten because the Big Ten, A, if the Big Ten's goal is to expand its TV footprint, then Florida being in the state of Florida matters. Uh, if the Big Ten's goal is to piss off Greg Sankey, which I think it might be, then Florida, being in Florida matters. Um, and C, if you look at the SEC, I mean, Georgia doesn't want any part of Florida State being in the SEC. Alabama doesn't want any parts of that. Florida doesn't want any parts of that. Um, it's a... And, and the SEC network is already fully distributed and getting paid a whole hell of a lot of money within the state of Florida. There's not this need to have Florida State. So it's a really fascinating thing because I think, um, you know, you look at some of the – the way that the, the league is split up, I would probably say that, like, um, you know, Clemson is certainly more of an SEC profile. Florida State is more of an SEC profile. But those two schools probably would matter more financially to the Big Ten than the other way around. Then you look like a, at a place like North Carolina, which as much as they have not been great in football uh, over any sort of long stretch of time, there is a lot of interest and in, they might be the most in demand of the ACC teams when realignment happens or when realignment comes for the ACC. But they probably profile much better to the Big Ten. And I think they might actually be the team that the SEC is most interested in. So it's sort of a weird – this is the, the weird – vibe of of realignment is that so little of it has to do with the actual caliber of the teams or who you know the ph philosophical overlaps and so much of it has to do with like how much more money can you add to our bottom line mm. yeah and, and and obviously florida state fans like myself and EJ, obviously you guys just cover the team but we're so excited for the opening of the season right we have duquesne coming up Whatever LSU in New Orleans is a huge matchup, and then the obviously a bye week, and then Louisville comes up after that. I, I want to go around the horn real quick and, and ask all of you guys how important is are those two games, right? The, the, the LSU game and the Louisville game because two and oh, Mike Norvell probably buys himself two or three years. Oh, and two that's probably the end of his time at, at Florida State. Um. I don't know, Brendan. Tell me what happens with, with those two games. I'm sorry, I missed the question. I was trying to put sunglasses on. What, what's happening? <laughs> important, so, importance of LSU Louisville. That yeah, the, the, oh. those two games. How important are those? No, but seriously, those two games. So early. So we're gonna beat Duquesne. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, FCS schools and end up being guaranteed wins. Got Brendan, me a little shook right shut now, the but. hell up, Brendan. It's not going to happen. We're not losing to Duquesne, right? So tell me when Louisville and uh, LSU back to back, those are big. Like, if you go 0 2, is that the end of Mike Norvell? But if you go 2 0, does he extend his tenure by two years? Because <laughs> I think those are two extremely important games for, for Mike Norvell. I mean, micro level, like it's, it's, but you go micro, you can go macro. Like it, it is a big stretch. And for just the, like purely the optics, like, yes, it, it it's going to be important. Cause if you say three, and zero, uh, that's going to make everyone feel good. And then the, like the trickle down effect with recruiting, like Hakeem Williams uh, will probably be committing in late September, early October. He is a, a top uh, 25 recruit in the country. Probably somebody who's only going to keep ascending, uh, and FSU has a legitimate chance there, but I think you have to have two or three wins at the point of like when he's going to be committing uh, in, in late September, most likely. So like just, and we're talking about like very like small picture stuff, like it's going to matter big picture with the optics as well. Like, yeah, that that's going to be important the way the fan base views Mike Norvell. I don't think if, if FSU starts one and two, that's going to end his tenure though. Like it, you could maybe make the argument that would set the tone for the rest of the season, put you behind eight ball. And then you talk about lame duck status, like in 2023. Uh, but I think Florida state will probably be underdogs in both those games. So it is fair to remember like that, that this probably is it like three, and zero is not likely it is possible. It is on the table. Uh, what it would mean to me, like the biggest thing I would take away from like what a three, no start would be is that that totally changes the math of what this team could be. 
if you have what should be, again, two upsets, Louisville is going to be pretty good. I think probably a harder game than than LSU, to be honest. Uh, and, and, um, I agree. No, I and, agree. And, and at Louisville, too. Um, like, that would then be a conference win for Florida State, a division win. Uh, probably one of the t- three harder teams in your uh, in your division. So, like, yeah, that would be significant. And all of a sudden, you're looking at 3-0. and Like, the math changes on what Florida State could be uh, that season. And you're talking about six or seven wins, the more likely range. If you start three and zero, well, then eight or nine wins becomes like that. That very much so becomes like what that's on the table, and that to get to your point, uh, Richie is like uh, you're starting to talk about contract extension at that point. So yeah, it it's big. It's big for a lot of reasons that start for Florida State. I don't go in that far, but I, I do want to ask Kurt uh, same question. Like this season is so important because obviously, right, Mike Norvell he, he got a pass in the COVID year and some fans are upset. Some fans aren't whatever it may be. And I feel like an idiot with sunglasses on it as I look at myself right now. But at the same time, like that was a free year. Right. And then five and seven, not what we wanted. Right. That's a bad season. Is eight wins the, the minimum. And Kurt. So from you, like for me, I th- I think eight wins you have to get to, and seven is is okay. You'll you'll survive six or less. I'm not sure, but j- j- just talk about w- what are the what should rational Florida State fans expect from the team this year? Yeah, I think you're right in that. I mean, I think most people not understood obviously the COVID of it all that that Mike Norella had early in his tenure, but also the roster he was inheriting. I mean. People were kind of sold a bad bill of goods with Willie Taggart at the start of his tenure of him, his whole, this isn't a a rebuild, it's a realignment. When, no, it it was a rebuild, and he made things worse for Mike Norvell that he inherited. So I think people, for the most part, have been patient with him. Obviously, uh, Jacksonville State didn't help him. But I still feel like, overall, uh, the most part, people are optimistic because they're seeing the progress. But, yeah, this is the year where I, I would say you need the the proof of concept if you're Mike Norvell. I would not set the minimum at eight wins because I, when you look at, I mean, sometimes progress works that way, but not always. But there are also, I mean, whatever the record is, there are like, how did that, how did we get there? It's not just the record, but how it happened. But uh, yeah, I, I think six is, I mean, obviously they still got two more buyout payments to Willie Taggart. So I think it would take a pretty bad season for this to be, it for Mike Norvell and I'm not even sure six wins is that but his seat would be would be quite hot if if this isn't like I said kind of the the proof of concept going into 2024 or 2023 sorry somebody figured out the internet and so that's fun down there Ingram I just want to get your take on recruiting in general right now we did a spaces the other night and uh your counterpart I believe allegedly tweeted that uh the class is starting to feel kind of 2010-ish. Obviously, we have to close. Um, and again, your counterpart tweeted that he agreed with that from a, a certain podcast account. We won't call any names here. But uh, just talk to us about where Florida State's had in recruiting. Brendan mentioned and talked about Hakeem Williams. Um, obviously, would be huge. Um, so just talk to us where you feel that is in general. No, this nice lady was uh, let me come and join her house and grab on Wi-Fi. So that was very nice. That's I said, "Amazing, ma'am, there's all these family value Ingram Smiths out there wearing sunglasses <laughs> on this stupid podcast. I need to be able to respond. So, and now she's sponsoring the podcast. To the Williams family of South, uh, <laughs> South Hill, Virginia that let me join you. So here I am. Yeah, recruiting is wildly important. If I get disconnected, I want to go ahead and tell David Hale again that I'm way more ACC than he is. Basically, <laughs> I basically like had my thumb in the air trying to find internet connection along Southside Virginia for about an hour now. Uh, but I'm happy to be able to join y'all. And uh, yeah, no, recruiting is everything. And really, uh, the 2023 class will be imperative to whether or not Mike Norvell has success and whether or not he can stick around. But And I don't... You know, I know I've done the Nolcast for 12 or 13 years now. TJ had been fortunate to do it. And I try not to to sound like a weirdo when I do it. But I, I don't mean to sound like that guy that, uh, you know, starts to talk about eighth graders or ninth graders or 
something like that. But the class of 2024, Florida State has a chance to legitimately sign like a top six class in the country. Uh, so, again, I don't want to start telling you all to look at sophomores and juniors in high school, but the 2024 class has a has a legitimate chance to be a transformative class for Florida State, particularly with its strength uh, in the state of Georgia. And they've already gotten some really legitimate commitments from that. So 2023 will be the class that kind of puts you on the route that is successful. And 2024 has a legitimate chance to have you signing like a top five, six or seventh class in the country and getting back to recruiting, you know, in the in the uh, gated neighborhoods that the ACC commissioner has referenced previously. I want to go to Carter um, for a minute and and kind of ask your perception on this, but I think we've seen more confidence. I know you're newer, so I won't ask you to speak on like previous years, but I think we've seen more confidence out of Mike Norvell uh, this offseason than, than we've seen in quite a while. And so as a newer guy, I just want to know how that projects to you. I want to know what your kind of thoughts around that are. He's he's high on this team. And again, you know, we've we've alluded to it. The last two years have not been great. And I think he knows this team needs to be good for, for him to continue in this role. Will you just talk to me about Coach Norvell's confidence and, again, how that kind of projects to you and what your thoughts are there? Yeah, I think really just the last couple of years, obviously kind of dealt a bad hand, as Kurt mentioned, with the roster he inherited, with COVID. Also had a very young team. And so – you know, this year there's a lot of continuity. I know, you know, Jermaine Johnson, Keir Thomas left, but just about everyone else back uh, on the defense, on offense, this is really the first year they've had a quarterback who was cemented as the starter uh, well ahead of the season. Um, and, and they like the pieces they've added. I mean, obviously the O-line and the wide receiving core has been you know, pretty rough in recent years, but I think they feel better about those groups than they've had these last couple of years under Norvell. So I think um, that's part of it. Also depth. I think, I mean, like you, you look at a guy like Malik Feaster coming in from Jacksonville state uh, last week, you know, is he a guy who's going to start for you and be a big, you know, big time guy for you? Probably not, but you know, having him as your fallback option, if someone gets hurt, like I think they feel better that, he's that guy than the guys they've had in the past. So, um, you know, you look at the O-line this year, adding two new, 10 new guys. Um, also, I think the freshman class has really impressed uh, and, and kind of shown that the future can be pretty bright. Uh, in the spring, I think most of the guys on defense really stood out uh, from, you know, Zaria Thomas to Stan McCall, Omar Graham. Bishop Thomas. I mean, there, there was a lot of guys in that freshman class who have stood out. Um, you mentioned earlier the importance of the first couple games, you know, Louisville LSU. Um, you know, this season won't have too much of an effect on the 2023 class. It, it'll be more about the 2024 class. Usually a season has more impact on the, the next cycle than the current one, just with the way that the early signing period is now. And so, you know, I think the problems recruiting wise for Florida State has been more about finishing and being the top school. They've been in on a lot of five stars. They've 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 brought a lot of guys to campus, but they they tend to finish second place, third place. You have a strong season this year and that 24 class, which is looking really, really good. You know, they can they can finish top 10. They can finish potentially top five if they have that seven, eight win season. And they show that that arrow is pointed in the right direction. My my take on the schedule, and I don't, you know, if anybody just wants to step up and answer this, um, more than more power to you. And then I want to I want to get some record predictions, and and then we'll get out of here. Um, maybe I'll ask David uh, his take on the on the schedule, and then we'll we'll do some record predictions. Brendan's got to get out of here to go to. Uh, you know, another non-sponsored podcast to, to record. So, um, but uh, we'll wrap up here in a few minutes. If you're watching, if you're listening, again, click the subscribe button. Uh, click the like button. You're, if you're on your mobile phone, you have to swipe down in the chat, and you should see the subscribe button right there. Appreciate you guys all for hanging out. Appreciate those that have been in the comments, tried to form some questions around what your comments have been. So appreciate that. Um, 
David, I think Florida State's schedule sets up well. I'm more than happy for you to tell me that I'm wrong on this, but I think that you know you you get the extra day for LSU because that's a you, you get the warm up game and the extra day for LSU because it's a Sunday night. You get the bye week before you have to go to Louisville. I think that's pretty advantageous instead of going there on a short week on a Friday night. You got a you got kind of a favor because of the week zero game, and you get to come home to BC, who Florida State should be a favorite in that game as well. Uh, October is kind of murderer's row with Wake, NC State, and Clemson. But then after that, I think the schedule really lightens up. The toughest game left is probably Miami on the road, um, and, and I think that'll be kind of a a coin flip at the end of the day. Maybe maybe a slight edge to Miami being being on the road uh, in Doak South. But just thoughts on the way that Florida State's schedule lines up uh, in general. Yeah, first of all, I can't see anything with these damn sunglasses on in here. So this, I hope this running this joke out is uh, worth it. Um, I, I just, while we were talking, I went and looked up on, uh, for whatever you want to call FPI, if you like it or you don't. Uh, but the odds of FSU winning its first three and starting 3-0, and according to FPI, are 11.5%. So a little better than a 1-10 in 10 shot. But to, that mostly comes down to the LSU game, um, which is the one where they're probably likely to be the heaviest underdog, but I, I, I agree. This sets up all right. They've got a warm up essentially against Duquesne. Um, I don't know. Is LSU? I, I don't know what. To, I mean, I, Brian Kelly is underrated as a coach. There's no doubt about that. This is a coaching upgrade at LSU. But this isn't a team that was blowing the doors off of anybody since for the last two years. And it's a team that lost to UC, uh, UCLA in its opener last year. Like, this is a winnable game. And, and this here's a question. I'll put this out to you guys, and you can answer it if you want. LS, beating LSU would be the biggest win for Florida State since blank. Because it's been a while. I mean, there's been a couple of big games. You know, Notre Dame last year, Virginia Tech to start Willie Taggart's uh, tenure. You know, big hyped games. But they lost They lost them, ultimately. So, so a win over LSU would be, yeah. I think. 2016 Ole Miss. Yeah. 2016 Ole Miss. No, I can say the Orange Bowl, but it doesn't Michigan. mean it was a bowl yeah. game. Because, no, I, yeah, I Peppers, think that 2016 Peppers, Peppers Peppers Ole Miss game was a big deal. You guys heard, so. I, I got a hot take for it. Twenty, it, It's not the exact same, but 2013 Clemson. Uh, because 2013 Clemson obviously was like – it was a signal to the whole world like, hey, Florida State is yeah, here to mess yeah. up some stuff. This would be different. It would be, a, it would be symbolic in a different way of taking a step back to relevancy. Obviously, not competing for a national title, but I think it would be a significant step. And like, it'd be the first time since 2013 that FSU had a win that like reverberated and signaled some things to come. See, Brendan, I I, I think it was like you, you probably were there. That's 2016. The I understand that it's not the exact same thing. I understand. No, I, look, I I totally agree with what you're saying. Actually, is it's not like the 2013 Clemson game. Carly can't said, figure out where to go. It, it was the it was the don't f with us game. If you were Florida State, it was like all all the people who've been laughing at us for losing stupid yeah. games. We shouldn't. Uh, and, we're not going to do that this. Anymore. Is the don't f and forget us game? Two two exactly. very different things. <laughs> That's exactly. They're two different things, but it is. They're both statement games. I you know Florida State certainly won some big ones in between those two, but, but like that was that going into that Clemson game was the last, you know, the last time that I think um, Florida state won a game that fans weren't really kind of, ex I, I don't know. They were probably expecting them to win that game. I don't know. It, it's interesting. I think it's a good discussion. Uh, I will say the schedule sets up not great, but because it is so front loaded and October is going to be problematic. But if you get that LSU game, uh, you know, you can – whatever happens at Louisville, I think, is sort of a uh, – if, if you take LSU, I don't think the L, the Louisville game matters as much. You should beat Boston College, David, which is going to be – don't let us beat LSU and then Louisville. That's a I, – I, I think it's going to be tough for them to win both of those games. But I, I think agree. they can, 100%. They can certainly – I thir certainly think they can win one of the two. Boston College should be a win. Wake, they match up better with than people think. And then you have the Clemson and North Carolina State – back-to-back uh, -back that is just brutal um, because I don't think either of those are good matchups for Florida State. Uh, then you got the back – so it's really how much can you survive from the first half because the back half can play can be pretty strong. If you can steal a game in the first half and be, feel like you're making progress through that first six, the back six, you've got a chance to win really almost all of them, if not all of them, and finish the year in a really good place. Um you know, I don't know. Would you rather, I mean, given where this FSU team is, would you rather 
have the first half of the schedule be – would you rather the schedule be front-loaded or back-loaded? I, I almost think this is better. It's a good test for the team early. Um, if the fans will kind of ride with them, if it's a, a you know a three-and-three three start, I think they have a chance to finish strong. Yeah, no, I think so. I think you you'd rather it – be easier going on as your team continues to get better. Um, and even with those front loaded, it's, it's almost like more mid loaded, right. With October being so tough because I, I don't think LSU is like leagues better. I don't think Louisville's leagues better. I think you could split there. Uh, you could also go on two there. Uh, and then you need to be BC to get back to 500. But yeah, I think that if you could steal one of those, that could, that could be really huge. All right, let's do some uh, record predictions and then let's get out of here. Um, all right, we'll go around the horn. We'll go Brendan first because he's gonna, um, he's got to go. No, no, you got to stay through the end of this, Brendan. They'll they'll be fine. Um, I'm good. To, I'm good. I'm good to like eight ten. It's not like the sponsor. It's not like the podcast is sponsored, Bre- anyways. It's- Brendan is gonna stay until someone sponsors him. That's he's just it's like those guys that used to stand on the top of like a a billboard, you know, waiting for like the Bills to win a game. Brendan is just going to stay on this podcast until someone steps up to sponsor. Yeah, he'll be on here for a long time. So, all right. Um, <laughs> what is – because this this horrible fan base um, needs to know. What is your uh, record prediction with Jordan Travis at quarterback? And then also – so, like, that's the one I want you to talk about and how you get it there. But I also want to hear your record prediction if the unfortunate happens and Tate Martell has to start every game. So, let's do both of those. Tate Rotomaker. Tate Tate. Sheesh. I made too many Miami small uh, jokes. And so Tate Rodemaker, if Tate Rodemaker has to start, it's, it's not live. Um, Tate Rodemaker has to start. Uh, what's what's your record uh, in both those scenarios? We'll go Brendan, then Ben, then Carter, um, Kurt. No, then Ingram, out of respect to the Williams family here, that's let me uh, okay, get, get, yeah. him out, get him out of right their Wi Fi, right. please. Ingram, Ingram last. So we're doing alphabetical order. So Williams family is last. Um, Brendan. All right. So. It's what's the record if Jordan Travis starts all 12 games and what's the record if Tate Martell yeah. Rodemaker starts all 12 games? Yeah, you messed it up like me. Yeah. No, I was making fun of you. That's what I was doing. All right, so if you have a healthy Jordan Travis for all 12 games, I, so before the season, I or before before spring practice, when we started looking at the schedule, I was thinking five to six wins is what this team was. And kind of saw in the spring, saw some improvements, some things I liked that was kind of in the six-win range. Uh, seeing that they've retained a lot of what they built on in the spring, uh, seeing some of the transformation at a few positions, offensive line, linebacker, uh, wide receiver being some of them. Uh, Trey Benson continues to be the real deal. I, I'm probably going to stay at seven wins right now for Florida State. I think seven and five is reasonable. I, I do think the the floor is higher for this team than I thought initially. I think the ceiling, like the upside to win eight or nine games is there. I don't think that will hit that. But I do think that that exists. There's a ton of variance, however. But seven and five is what I got. If you have Jordan Travis, all 12 games, I would potential to, to maybe outkick that by a few more wins. Uh, if it's Tate Rodemaker, you know, he's been okay at, at times uh, in camp. He's had a few really great moments and then some not so good ones as well. But he's certainly better than what he was two years ago uh, when he's thrown to the fire as a freshman or, or even last season. So he's definitely improving. I think you probably let's see, you probably beat. Oh, I think I think four wins. I think four and eight is probably what you are. There's still a pretty big variance uh, between the two quarterbacks, and especially some of the deficiencies you still have on offense, even if it's better. Jordan Travis really makes the offense tick in a pretty profound way. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's a three-win difference between the two right now. Ben? Yeah, I think if, if Jordan is healthy for a full season and, and things go right for this team in terms of luck um, – Eight wins, I think, is pretty reasonable. You know, I, especially looking at groups like the offensive line and wide receiver. If they're able to stay healthy and keep those groups intact and improve them the way we think they can, uh, eight wins is, I think, uh, maybe a little optimistic, but I think it's reasonable um, considering everything. But if Jordan, if Jordan does not play. I think this is a three or a four win team. I, I think the difference, like 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 Brendan was saying, it, it, it's just so stark. Because Jordan, I mean, he is the generator of this offense. The offense is built around him. They're going to be successful, you know, with him. And if they're not successful, it's going to be because he wasn't there. Something went very wrong. Um, So I I think Jordan's going to look really good this year. I 
I would expect eight wins if things go right, like I said. But if not, uh, three, four wins, that's, that's, uh, that's where this team is. Uh, Ingram. Florida State wins eight games this year. Uh, now, my caveat there is that a, a bowl bite may be part of it, but uh, I think this team is better than it has been in quite a while. Maybe I'm just getting getting drunk on the, the uh, August dreams, but uh, I think this is a significantly more competent program than it has been in a while. I think it's going to go two and one in its first three games. I think it may win seven and eight in a bowl game, or I think it'll win eight and lose its bowl game. But uh, – I think this will not be the disaster that previous seasons has been and will be the first real step forward that Florida State's made in quite a while. If, if Tate had to start all 12 games, where, where would you put the uh, win-loss at? We're, we're screwed. There's no, uh, there's no <laughs> joke to be made about that, despite people's uh, aggressively positive comments based off a series of reps in practice or something like that. Uh, Tate Rodemaker is going to have to show me something that I haven't otherwise seen, and I'm not trying to – Pick on a kid, but if Jordan Travis goes down, then I agree with previous people that Florida State probably wins uh, at worst three, at best five. Kurt Weiler, Yasiola. I'm, I'm in line with, with a, a lot of what other guys have said. I think I, I'm going to lean, supposing Jordan plays all year, I'm going to go seven and five with eight and four being more likely than six and six. I mean, we've talked about there's a couple tough ones, no doubt, and you're not going to win all those toss-up games. But I do like that. I think a wild card that we haven't discussed here that I'm interested to see how it plays out is Mike Norvell having maybe more of a hand in the offensive play calling in the game this season. I know that was something he he gave some more to Kenny Dillingham because that was somebody who knew his offense, who he'd worked with before. But that's not going to be as much the case with Alex Atkins. So I, I'm interested to see if the, what kind of difference that that can make. We might be able to tell early in the season. I doubt we'll be able to tell in the Duquesne game. Um, I almost wonder. My thing is, I, Tate or Tate? Geez, now you got me doing. It. I know it's my fault, guys. Is he still in college football? He's selling NFTs in Vegas now. I think. I'm not no even actually kidding football. about that. I think that's He's actually true. Cool. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is Tate is definitely the backup right now. And I think in an ideal world, they wouldn't want AJ Duffy to see the field this year, except for maybe a, 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 uh, just like a blowout game, late game situation. But if Jordan were to go down, I almost wonder if they wouldn't at some point go to Duffy out of like, almost like a, uh, trying to save my job panic. And it'd be interesting to see what would happen there. I haven't seen enough from AJ to think that would go especially well. I'm where, with where a lot of the other guys are in like the three to five win range. Uh, Carter Carroll's Tassie Democrat. What's your take here on the record? So I'm thinking seven and five, but when you're including the bowl, just to be conservative, I'll say eight and five because I think eight and four is is very much possible too. Like Kurt said, I, th I think eight wins is more uh, of a possibility than six. Um, when Jordan plays, they're a much better team. Uh, so when, when Tate, if it was Tate, I'd say four wins. Uh, I think the, the the strength of this team though will be the defense. Um, I don't, I don't think. Uh, I mean, obviously they don't have a player quite like Jermaine Johnson, but I don't think they have a glaring weakness really anywhere on their defense. I think defensive end will obviously be the position where they've really got to fill some big shoes, but I don't think it's going to be a weakness per se, maybe against the run, but, um, but I, I think the linebackers are strong enough. Jamie Roberts is strong enough to, I think they will be a decent team against the run. So they'll, they'll have a good defense. I think their running game is going to be much better with an improved offensive line uh, with Trey Benson in there. Uh, I think he'll be their top rusher this year easily and a uh, better wide receiving core. I just think they're the, the arrows pointing up. And when you look at last year, Went five and seven, but they lost quite a few coin flip games. They easily could have been seven and five last year. Um, this is a better team than last year, so I think they win a couple more of those coin flip games, and they have quite a few on the schedule. So seven and five, eight and five, that's kind of what I'm seeing. Tate, uh, I think it would be four and eight, and I don't think he would be the starter the whole year. I think they would turn it to AJ at some point. Because I think you know who Tate Rodemaker is, but you don't quite know who A.J. Duffy is. The thing about A.J. Duffy is um, he shows you moments in practice. You know, he'll show you the arm talent, the athleticism, 
but he doesn't show you the consistency yet. So I think if you have that opportunity where you're trying to grow somebody and develop somebody uh, and, and show some semblance of promise for the future, that would be where you would take advantage uh, and, and put him in at some point. All right, we'll round it out. I've got one more question after this one, and we'll get out of here. But David Hale, what's your uh, what's your schedule take for uh, FSU this year? I think bottom end is five and seven. Top end is probably eight and four. I think I'm probably in the seven and five range is the most likely outcome. Um, you know, I think they've got a chance. They're going to be in some games. The, the interesting thing about FSU to me this year that has not been true, uh, and and a couple of these guys have already kind of alluded to this is there's not this black hole anywhere on the depth chart they're good almost everywhere now are they great anywhere that's the, the big question for me are they going to have a type a develop at wide receiver and only or on the defensive line i think that's one of the things to watch particularly early on if they do have sort of that jermaine johnson guy step up um then, then maybe the number can go a little higher maybe you're definitely sold on eight uh but they're going to be in games because they're just not they don't have this glaring weakness anywhere uh and i'm also Right in line. I think, you know, if you're going to predict when the injury is going to happen, I think if, if Jordan Travis gets hurt in week one, then you probably have this short window of Rodebaker, and then they're going to hand it over to Duffy and say, all right, future's yours, kid. If it happens in week 10 and you need a win to get to a bowl game, I don't know. You're probably up in the air. But I, I, I tend to think – I've already I've heard some from some folks behind the scenes that, that, that the ceiling on Duffy has already looked really good. I think there's a lot of upside there. If you had to go to him, I mean, look, Miami looked like a train wreck last year when Tyler Van Dyke first took over for Derek King. And the last six games of the year, he was as good as any quarterback in the country. I, I, just the, the 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 time to get a young QB acclimated, it, it does probably take a game or two, but it ain't like it used to be. I don't think anybody worries about it. And I think he keeps sort of, Duffy would keep more of what Jordan Travis does to allow the offense, particularly the run game, to function. Duffy at least kind of gives you that to kind of hopefully you rely on your ground game and try to ground and pound to a couple of wins. I think that's probably the way you go. Anyway, I've droned on for too long now. <laughs> You're good. Now, a lot of agreement there. Um, I have one more question we'll go around the horn with, kind of just like that one. Again, if you're watching, if you listened, hit the like and subscribe button. We certainly do appreciate it. Again, if you're a big FHU fan, if you hung out with us for an hour and 15 minutes, you're a big uh, supporter of FSU, you should be shopping at Garden and Gold. Use code NOSLAW, N-O-S-L-A-W, to get 15% off of your order at Garden and Gold. The Nike stuff's in. The Columbia stuff's in. Get threaded up good for uh, for game day. And then Gramco, thegramco.com, um, DFNS25 to save 25% there. All right, guys, around the horn, Richie and I will do schedule predictions um, later, so we didn't. that's why we didn't answer that uh, for those commenting. Um We'll go in reverse order here. See if I can remember the order that people just went in. But uh, what one thing does Mike Norvell's career at Florida State depend on? David Hale, you're up first. Uh, Miami game this year. I think they win the Miami game again. He's good in almost any scenario that isn't a complete catastrophe. I think if they lose the Miami game and they finish 6-6, six and six, I think Mike Alford has already shown – is the type of AD who is more than happy to find his guy make a splash. I, God knows, I hope it's not Dion, but I think you're going to see some conversations about that. I say Miami game means everything. I like it. Carter. I'm going to go with recruiting. Uh, I think but they've been a little bit outside the top 20 the last couple of years. This year, they may finish around there. Next year is where they tape probably that next step. Uh, they could finish this class pretty strong. We'll see. But uh, to be to be a great team, you got to recruit at a top 15, top 10 level. Uh, they haven't quite gotten there for, for many reasons. I think if they can finish with more guys, if they can you know, show that they're strong in NIL-wise, they've done great with the transfer portal, but that's more of a short-term fix. You can't get 10-plus guys in the transfer portal every year. You got to get at least 15 to 20 high school guys every single year. That's the next step for this program. Wean off those transfers, get more high school guys. Uh, I think this freshman class that they had coming in shown a lot of promise that, that they can get some guys that they feel good about. The next step is 
getting more high school guys and transfers and, and really uh, hitting on those guys. Uh, Kurt, what one thing does Mike Norvell's career depend on? Beyond the obvious cop out that is saying Jordan Travis's health, I, I would say um, <laughs> the, I would I would say the pass rush being there this year. I think when you look at the defense everywhere else, I think they're going to be better this year than they were last year at defensive tackle, at linebacker, and in the secondary. If the pass rush is what we think it could be, if we see kind of the high end of Dennis Briggs, of Derek McClendon, of Jared Verse, even maybe a, a Byron Turner or a Pat Payton. I, th I think that the defense will be dominant enough that that it will kind of maybe help the team overachieve and win a lot of those tight games. If the pass rush takes a significant step back with losing Jermaine and Keir, I, I, I worry if that's enough of a problem that it costs them a few. Ingram Smith, what kind of scotch is that? Yeah, with all due respect to our previous guests, I think they're making it too complicated. Mike Norbell's career depends on whether or not he goes to a bowl game this year. And if you get to that point, you're probably here next year. If you don't, you're probably fired. And it doesn't matter as to what a particular position group does. It doesn't matter as to who stays healthy. The record is the record. And if you go to a bowl game, you're here next year. If you don't, then we're all rebuilding this project all over again. Take us home. Ben Meyerson, Tomahawk Nation. Yeah, I think it's it's got to be winning those 50-50 games this year. Um, I kind of agree with what Ingram just said with, you know, this 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 team needs to to get to that bowl game eligibility to to really be in a place to for Mike Norvell to be comfortable. Uh, with with the, those 50-50 games we saw last year, it was really the difference between this team being 5 and 7 and 7 and 5 and like Ingram just said, your record is your record. So um, I think if they can get a few of those games that they really need to get, especially, uh, you know, in October, um, they get some wins there. Man, uh, you know, I, I'm a big believer in momentum, and I think this team could carry that momentum to the end of the season. So winning those 50-50 games has to be it. Well, much like David Hale, I do not believe in momentum. Um, that's a different podcast <laughs> for another day. Thank you. Um, absolutely not. Uh, but, Ben, I'm fine with you having that take. Guys, I do want to go around the horn one more time. I know we did it at the beginning, but I, I really do appreciate your time, and I, I'd love if you just took 10 seconds and, and shouted out your, your outlet, wherever people can follow you, find your work. Um, appreciate you guys' time, and so want to always give that opportunity. Uh, we'll start with Ben. Uh, we'll just go right like it is. Ben, Carter, Kerr, Ingram, and then David. Richie and I, people know where that is. Yeah, you can go uh, follow me on Twitter at by Ben Meyerson and uh, check out my work on YouTube as well. And then uh, I'll be posting a lot of great stuff for Tomahawk Nation leading up to the season, so you can look out for that. Carter. Is it, it's my turn? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter at Carter Carls. Uh, you can find a Tallahassee Democrat uh, at www.tallahassee.com. Uh, again, fairly new around here, so if you haven't seen me, uh, feel free to reach out and, and tell me what you think about the team. I love being interactive with fans. So uh, also I have the Null Sports Podcast. We'll, we'll answer your questions uh, every now and then. So uh, lo love love covering Florida State so far and uh, looking forward to my first season. I kind of kind of – a bummer that the first game I'll cover is Duquesne, to, to be quite honest, but uh, really looking forward to uh, the first game at Dope. As a team that's lost, uh, I don't know how many openers in a row, we we don't feel bad that your first game is Duquesne. Like It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be nice to have one in the win column. Uh, Kurt? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Kurt M. Weiler. Uh, recently with the Osceola on the Rivals Network, uh, building our YouTube presence there, really having – I mean, it's it's an awesome opportunity to get to take over, and and I think we've I've been really happy with the work we've done there so far. Um, I think our our thirty month or our free August trial just expired today, but if you reach out to me, you can DM me on Twitter. I think I can get you a, a free thirty day trial. Ooh, I like to plug Ingram. Yo, shout out to the Williams family here for making this possible. <laughs> uh, big thank you to them, and I want to drive everybody to the Osceola. Uh, you can go look at what Cart and the team's doing over there. It's the new Rivals.com option for Florida State fans. I don't have a damn thing to do with it, so don't think that I have anything. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, serotypiously point people in that direction. But big move for them. Happy to see what you guys do with it, Kurt. Uh, great, great studio as to what I've seen so far. And best of luck moving forward, man. 
David Hale, take us home, bud. Uh, I'd like to plug um, love dash chat dot xyz best adult <laughs> dating site, uh, which has been doing a great job chiming in in the uh, comments here. Uh, you can follow me. I, I at uh, my my Twitter handle is at a David Hale joint, and this would be a great time to follow me because tomorrow we have two really exciting things happening. Uh, the first is our annual position you story comes out on ESPN.com. And this is the day every summer when NC State fans just lose their freaking minds because we don't Thanks, identify bud. them. I appreciate you doing that before oh, my positional God. preview so we can complain. <laughs> oh, well, David Hale has any... us 13 of 14. What an idiot. <laughs> Listen, that just – yeah, I hear what you're saying. I'm not – you know, but look, I'm, I, I'm just here to plug what I can plug. I don't control the rest of this stuff. Uh, also, we will be doing a Twitter Spaces at noon tomorrow, in which Brendan Sinone will will be joining us in sunglasses to talk a little FSU <laughs> at some point. So, anyway, thanks for having me, y'all. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate you, man. Again, appreciate the people that make this possible. Guthrie's Garnet and Gold and Graham Co. If you haven't, go sign up at risingspear.com. Shoot me a message if you're going to the Duquesne game. Love to have you out for a tailgate. Um, if you need any details on that, you can hit my DMs. Rising Spear has a ton of new things coming out over the next few weeks and into August. Uh, everything from uh, exclusive member benefits, such as annual um, player uh, signed items, personalized videos from student athletes, virtual meet and greets, and access to Rising Spear exclusive content. Shout out Matt Quigley and the guys over there. They're doing a great job with our NIL efforts. Gentlemen, thank you guys so much for hanging out. If you watched, if you listened, make sure to smash that subscribe button, hit the like button. We will see you guys all again. Go Knowles.